Okay, we're joined today by City Council Member Melissa Mark Viverito and by Adam Lightman Bailey, a real estate lawyer. And we're here to discuss new legislation that would have big implications for tenants and landlords across the city. Council Member, we're going to start with you. Okay, the City Council is considering two pieces of legislation regarding landlord and tenant harassments. Can you tell me a little bit about your bill specifically? Well, the bill that um, I've co-sponsored with Dan Gerodnik and Speaker Quinn and about 30 other colleagues is, is done specifically to protect and create a new legal framework to protect tenants that are unduly being harassed by their landlords as ways of trying to get them out of their apartments so that the landlord can then get the apartments out of rent stabilization and get higher rent for them. So this is really done uh, in taking into account what's happening in the city in this day and age. Well, I thought that there were protections already for a number of issues. Why is this, how is this different? Well, this is actually going to allow uh, the cause of action to be harassment of the, the tenant. That's mm -hmm. not something that exists within the laws right now. Right now, if a tenant is denied basic services, let's say heat, mm -hmm. they would have to take the landlord to court for every offense. So instead, they can't go to the, the judge and say, well, this has been a pattern, and I believe very strongly that this is harassment that's being done so that I could get, you know, they could force me out of my apartment. They can't do that. They would have to go to court in every instance that heat uh. is deprived. So therefore, that's, that's what this provides is that it's new legal framework, which is very important in the climate that we're in. Now, you, you co-sponsored this bill with Speaker Christine Quinn and Councilmember Dan Gorodnik. Was there a need growing among your constituents for extra protection from harassment by landlords? I want to take my district as an yeah. example. My district is the average median income is about $28,000 a year. You have um, the 95 percent, I would say, 90 to 95 percent of the constituent issues that I deal with on a daily basis are housing related. Elderly people that have been living in their community for decades that are now finding themselves uh, with a lot of pressure from their landlord to get out. So we are finding it personal experience that a lot of people are coming with some of these frivolous lawsuits. Landlords that are taking tenants to court saying that they're paying rent, rent late, putting, adding on fees to their rental bills, providing, uh, denying actually basic services. These are things that we are experiencing day in, day out. Housing activists, advocates, others are seeing this as a pattern that's going on, and that's what really forced this legislation to happen. Mm -hmm. Now, what about the, the, there's some concern, and maybe, Adam, you can jump in when you want to, that <clears throat> this will lead to frivolous lawsuits. Again, when you take into account the people that I represent, when you're talking about people that in the city of New York, highest living, uh, highest, uh, the city with the highest cost of living, mm -hmm. that are making less than $30,000 a year, they are not going to be running to the courts to basically sue their landlord. It takes money to do that. Mm -hmm. It takes a certain level of understanding of the court system. I do not believe, I think that our, that argument does not bear weight. And what we do know is that 90% of the cases in the housing court are landlord initiated. So that should be some indication. So we believe very strongly mm -hmm. that once this law is implemented, that we will not see that concern being raised. Okay, now I'm going to turn the tables just a little bit. Many of us have heard some nightmare stories about living situations. I know a few myself, but Adam, you mentioned some on the phone with me the other day yourself where landlords were harassing tenants. Do you want to mention some of those? Or? I do think there's a problem in New York City because it's, it's like having, um, having a city called New York City and you put gasoline all over it and then you put in a match and it's lit on fire. Mm -hmm. And why is that? Because landlords want to get as much money as they can for their property. Tenants, because they moved in their apartment on a certain date, have a right to special protections called the rent regulation war, the laws, rent regulation laws. So those laws have said that I'm going to give you a discount on rent because we have a housing crisis in New York City. So the landlords want you out and the tenants want to stick. So the councilwoman is correct. There's a huge pressure for the landlords to try to get the tenants out. And in many cases, the tenants are unfairly treated. They're starting cases to try to get them out of their tenancies. So what do you do? Well, I don't have all the answers, but I do know that this is not the bill. The bill is overbroad. Okay? What this is going to cause is going to cause a requirement to build a new housing court. A separate building. There's going to be thousands of lawsuits, millions of dollars in legal fees. You're going to need more judges because according to that statute, if service is interrupted twice, that's harassment. And then what do you do? Well, a judge has to decide whether it's harassment. <coughs> well, I live in a co-op on the Upper East Side. I didn't have heat that last night. I had to put on extra clothes. And a couple, of, like a couple of weeks ago, I had the same problem. So that means that my co-op, my landlord, committed harassment, it's going to open the floodgates. Okay, let's, let's talk about the heat situation. What is 
considered a reasonable number of times to not have heat. I mean, I know from personal experience that a landlord should have an emergency system. They do up. already. They do. The, the, the government's done an incredible job, especially the housing preservation development. Yes. If you don't have heat, you call 311. And if the landlord doesn't fix it within 24 hours, HPD comes in and sends representatives and they fix it for you. So there's no need for the statute. The people there is need for the statute because if it is happening day in and day out, and what we're finding in certain situations is where very vulnerable, and, and you're talking about the low income and working poor in the city, people that are primarily in these rent regulated apartments to begin with, these are people that are experiencing this day in and day out. The the, they've been denied basic services, which is heat is one example, water may be another, etc. So it is after a certain certain number of times, if it happens to you three, four times a week, every week, you know, you, there should be a red flag being raised here. And what we're noticing is that the landlords have the means, they hire the fancy lawyers that understand the loopholes in this city and that will find a way of letting their landlords, uh, their, their clients know what is within the bounds of law. And we are trying to tighten again the, the laws here in this city to ensure that people that have built this city are not being left out. And that's very important. And we're unfortunately seeing these tactics. And we're not saying every single landlord is a bad landlord. Mm -hmm. We're being very clear about that. But that in the cases where there are landlords that are not treating the tenants right, that they have, those tenants have a right and will have a course of action in the courts to take their landlord to court. Okay. Adam Lightman Bailey PC represents hundreds of landlords. We don't see any landlords intentionally turning off the heat. We do see a rise in heat complaints when we switch from fall to winter and all of a sudden it gets really cold. That's a problem when it happens. But it's not like we needed a harassment law because of that. Okay, we wait, already let's, have not, let's not focus on the heat uh, question. Sure. Uh, let's, let's focus a little bit on whether the wording in, that, in the new statute that they've written is too broad. It's way too broad. All it says is two times where you don't have a service, it's harassment. And now you're going to have a court case. and. Mm -hmm. People without attorneys can sue. They do all the time in housing court. There's a special part, a special room only for repair problems where you almost never see an attorney representing a tenant. Okay, how about, how about this situation, which I know personally of. The landlord installs a brothel because he wants to get the, pe the people out of the building and an S&M club. This goes on for 10 years. There's so much noise in the building for 10 years, they can't sleep there at night for 10 years. What about that? Okay, so as soon as, that, as, soon as they see there's a brothel, they call 311 and let them know that. Okay. Three, this That's going to solve the problem? Yes, because under the Giuliani laws, which have taken many buildings, and have, what they do is they sue the landlord in state Supreme Court. And they say, landlord, you're responsible for cleaning up this building. And if you don't get rid of the prostitutes, then we will. The landlord who wants to get rid of rent stabilization and these rent-regulated tenants paying lower rents is happy to start a case. It's in Part D in 111 Center Street, a special part for prostitution cases, and they will start a holdover to evict the illegal use of the occupancy. The house and and also, it's also, it's also so again, the law is also speaks to disrupting of, of your living, you know, of how of the quality of life, so to speak. So if through the noise, you know, if it's an ongoing issue, mm -hmm. maybe creating an unsafe situation. Again, this is for a judge to decide, but this is again, will give a tenant an opportunity to go to court and say, I believe this is harassment for these reasons. Because again, the tenant is going to have to prove their case. So they're going to be able to prove, pre present the facts, and then that, that will enable them to use harassment as a course of action. That's what has to be understood. And then the judge will ultimately determine whether or not that pattern of behavior does imply harassment, and then the landlord will be fined accordingly. Well, let's take and that example. Ongoing, and that ongoing fine, having to pay those fees, will hopefully send a, me send a message to the landlords that are engaging in these illegal practices that they better think twice about what the way they treat their tenants. I, don't, I, don't, I respectfully disagree. Because first of all, okay. the brothel wouldn't come under that statute. Nowhere in that statute would it include a brothel. Illegality is not mentioned under it. Um, so it wouldn't come under that. But let's say it did. But is that perceived the harassment? Not on, they define harassment in the statute, which, is, which, which for some, I don't know why it's written this way, but if you take away any rights of tenants, then you're committing harassment. Well, many times tenants are paid money to give up their tenancies. So you're asking them to waive their tenancies, which is one of their rights. So that will, that will stop. No, they could do that if they want, but Not it does say specifically it will, because what happens in my case, again, you know, we have Pinnacle, we have Donny Day, which is another uh, large landlord in my district. What you're finding with a lot of the tenants, which are coming to us, saying that they get messages almost every day at the door, whether it's a knock, whether it's a call, whether it's a notice, saying, buy out, buy out. We'll pay you this much if you buy out. It's, it is a form of harassment, because you feel that you are being, being pressured into doing something that there may be you know, and there may be repercussions if you don't take 
pursue this avenue. So a buyout, excessively and aggressively, trying to ask somebody to get out of their apartment by paying them money, that should be considered a form of harassment. If someone want to allow that and want to take the money and leave, then that's upon them. But if somebody feels that through the calls, through the knocks on the door, through somebody visiting them, on and on and on, if they feel that is pressure, that is a, a type of harassment. So they should have an ability to go to court and that's take that That's a very on. good example. There is a need. Well, first of all, I got a woman in mm -hmm. Harlem, we represent tenants also, 1.2 million dollars for a small studio on 1200 Fifth Avenue. Go. So th that landlord that offered her money, right, to that's make her my, space, that's my, actually, that's that, my district, and we've been dealing with a lot of that landlord that there. offered her money. She calls me up at least once or twice a month, saying, "Adam, thank you. I love you. You made me. I was a poor woman, and now I'm rich. Right. Thank you." So that, so that, that situation where landlords pay tenants to leave can be a good thing. Now it can be, but, but again, but now, if it, it isn't, the landlord. Stop, the, sorry, let me just I want, I want you to tell me where you think a tenant could be bringing too many frivolous lawsuits against a landlord, which is the second bill, which you're, we're probably not going to talk about, but you can talk about. The bill, if the, if, the, if the landlord takes away any rights, which could be thousands of rights, heat, rats, hot water, um, a notice in the door, I mean, they don't define what taking away rights is, so it could be anything. Uh -huh. The tenant goes to court, starts a lawsuit, the landlord has to have a trial, a trial on those issues. Well. So who's going to pay the judges to more, you're going to have to hire more judges for this. Who's going to pay them? But the taxpayers. Who's really getting hurt? What about the small landlords that they, they're going to need attorneys? How are they going to afford $100,000 or $50,000 a case? They can't. This is a waste of money that could be going to feeding our kids, to paying our taxes, to enjoying Broadway or New York City. Instead, we're going to be being in housing court over a try to yeah. interpret a statute which has, doesn't have exact rules and is so overbroad, well, it's bad for New York, I don't think he's horrible a, for New I York. I don't think he's addressed the alternative bill, which I, I will not go into, right. I'm not sponsoring that right. bill. Uh, but with regards to our bill, it also does protect the landlords because it does okay. say that if a tenant goes to court twice, and it's found by a judge to have engaged in a frivolous lawsuit, then they're denied access. They will not be able to bring another case to court. Does so there count? does provide a level of protection to the landlords as well. This is not open-ended. I think that this is something that is desperately needed in this city. The time has come, and it's unfortunate that the time has come. But we feel that tenants have a right to really be protected. Adam, yeah, what, the what's your response to that? The statute doesn't say well, that. Well, which one are you Just, speaking to? I, I speak to yours. The statute says that if the tenant brings two cases and loses, brings two cases and loses, then the, they're barred from bringing another one. Do you know how big it is to bring a case? Okay? It takes three, six months to a year to actually have the case go to trial. You're going to start a case, discovery, motions. So if you're going to, if you're going to, you, could, you could only make two cases in a year probably by the time they finish. <coughs> plus, most cases settle in housing court. Ninety plus percent of the cases settle. So therefore, if you're actually going to um, have two trials, and if you, if you keep bringing these cases and the landlord doesn't want to pay for an attorney to go all the way to trial, which could be over $100,000, then they'll be able to bring as many as they want because it didn't go to trial, there's no prevailing party, and therefore the landlord loses because they could be back six times in a year. They, they're going to have to go to trial those two times just to stop the tenant from bringing another frivolous suit. Okay, can a, can a, can a tenant afford to bring all these Yes, cases? they don't have to hire an attorney under the statute. There's no requirement for an attorney. Well, how do they do this then? They, they, most tenants, when they have problems, they don't have heat or hot water or this vermin, they go to housing court for $40. For $40. Melissa? There's a petition. To they start a lawsuit for $40 and they get the a court date. And, and there's court attorneys there that assist the judge helping these tenants interpret their rights and presenting them to the court. No. And this is already in place and it's working very is well. No, work? it's not. No, it's not. And so I think, again, we are talking about the people that primarily will be beneficiaries of this law are people that are the working class, the working poor in this city, that can't take the time and don't have the luxury to be taking days off work, weeks off work. When you sit in court, you may have a court take, uh, time and date, but you may not be heard at the same time. You may have to sit there all day. These are people that don't have the luxury of wasting their time. So I think that that argument, I do not subscribe to it. I think many of us don't in the council. And, and uh, right now, this is a lot of this information, because this is not a cause of action harassment, a lot of this information is based on anecdotal uh, uh, experiences. And also so that the case and the court system, I think, also does not have a way of really knowing full well uh, or having an understanding in a, in a full sense whether or not this is going to increase the burden. I really believe that this is something that we, we need to pass in this city and that the facts will speak for themselves as this law is, um, is, is fulfilled. Okay, I'm, 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 I'm going to give you a chance to tell us how you would improve the law since you think it's too yeah. broad. I think 
I, I think the councilwoman's very good. I love her passion, and I think that she's got some great ideas, but I'm someone who lives this, so this is what I would do. I don't like the fact that landlords start cases sometimes that are frivolous, where they know that the person, in other words, if you're a rent state license tenant, you have to follow certain rules. Why the legislature created it this way, I don't know, but you have to live there full time, you can't illegally sublet, and you have to pay your rent on time. If you pay your rent late many times, uh, you know, a certain amount of times in a year, and you're chronically late, then you could still be evicted. So what the landlords do is sometimes they start cases where they are on the borderline. The person may have a house in the Hamptons, or they may have a house in Puerto Rico. Um, so they start a case that they really don't intend and believe they're winning. They bring them to court because they want to buy them out and give them money to leave. That's a problem. Now, how do we address that? Well, what if, what if we had a law that if, if a tenant writes a certified letter to the landlord not to contact them about a buyout, the landlord cannot do it anymore or have a financial penalty? That may be a good idea to solve one problem. <coughs> I think the problems with the heat, hot water, the warranty, and how it goes back, I think the courts are doing an incredible job, and the HPD is doing even better. The governmental agencies are going in and fixing these boilers when they're broken. That's changed in the last few years, yeah, and they're and, doing and an they're incredible billing, job. They're billing, they're billing the landlord $38,000, <coughs> which is great. They, they should pay it. They don't even know where no, they he do, is. No, they do, they don't pay them. It. They don't pay the lien <coughs> on the building. I know personally, they put a lien on the building, and then they foreclose on it. So mm -hmm. the landlord actually winds up paying that. And it's only a few years old, so the landlords, at first, Oh, they're never going to get this, and now they are. So that's actually not a problem. But the councilman brings in some good ideas. So I, I would I would put in things that don't require litigation, where there's fines if <coughs> I don't want to buy out. You do that. But as far as there is a whole there's a whole a vacuum that, that the councilman has a great idea on that we need to fill, but we need to do it without creating more problems, not creating more tax credits. So what do we do? How do we stop them from bringing in frivolous cases? Well, my idea on that is as follows. Right now in court, the loser pays, but the tenant doesn't want to have to hire an attorney to go all the way to trial and then beat them and then collect attorney fees. So maybe then, if the landlord starts a case and doesn't prevail, even if it doesn't go to trial, then the landlord has to pay the tenant a certain amount of money. Maybe an idea like that. <coughs> that's what I'm thinking of off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. you know, but, but we need to have a law that's not going to injure the taxpayers of New York City. We have a law that wants to help the people, and the law that's not going to cost any more money and cost chaos in New York. Well, that's where we differ. I believe very strongly that this is a, this, this is a bill, and many of us do. Again, my uh, my co-sponsoring colleagues and the council and the speaker believe that this is something that is for uh, the safety and the safeguarding. Uh, the tenants, and that it is in the best interest of the city of New York. And I believe after a couple of hours and we have lunch and dinner, maybe then I'll be able to convince her of uh, <laughs> reforming that bill and putting a new one. <laughs> well, we'll see who prevails. <laughs> well, you have you have uh, 32 council members. How many do you need to? Get this well, that's out. already way over the majority of 51. Okay. And, so and I'm not we're in good official. shape. And we've had HPD come to our first hearing and speak to uh, if in favor. They have concerns, but they did speak in favor. So I think that that demonstrates that there's a good means of support for this. Will bill. you make some adjustments based on their? There's input? always always room for improvement. Mm -hmm. We're always willing to listen. That's what the hearings are about. And if there's any improvements that can be made, we'll more than gladly look at them. So maybe you can send in your suggestions. The right. Well, the, the landlord community. Uh, <coughs> considers this a catastrophe, like a nuclear bomb coming and hitting them on the head. And, and that's the position. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, is that there are 31 people supporting this bill, which is a huge, huge problem. And hopefully we can sit down and, and, and have a consensus and have this withdrawn, torn up, and thrown away, and then we can start. <laughs> okay. Very cool. Well, thank you both for coming today. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Melissa, well, um, so tell me, uh, are these happening mostly, the, the harassment that you are referring to for this bill? The purpose of this bill is it for conversions or just for renters? No, I believe in a condo conversion situation, the people who are in the building have the option to re remain in the rent regulated apartment or be part of the buyout, so to speak. Uh, but that, so this would protect them because they continue to be in the rent regulated situation, despite the fact that other apartments in the building may be converting to a condo situation. So um, that that would my understanding, and I would have to just verify it. But my understanding it would still protect them as well. well. I, I can back it up. She's right. There's two plans when you're converting from a rental building to a uh, condominium. It's either a VIC plan or not a VIC plan. And very few people right. do VIC plans because you need a certain amount of the residents living there to buy in. So they do a not a VIC plan. So a not a VIC plan um, means that the rent regulated tenants get to stay in their tenancies for the rest of their lives or as, far, as long as they're following the laws re regarding rent regulation. So the, the buyers of these new construction or new construction condominiums, not new construction, the rehabs, the condo conversions, are 
eagerly seeking to get these rent regulated tenants out. Hmm. They offer the money, they do investigations. If they find right. out that they're living full time somewhere else, they're going to be evicting them. Our firm evicts people in these buildings that we find that are not following New York law. Uh, they're not primarily okay. living there. They illegally subletting. They don't pay their rent on time. They're uh, charging, overcharging their roommates that live there. And we do, we have researchers, investigators find these reports and go after them. So there's two sides to it. There's yeah. two sides to everything. Mm -hmm. Welcome yeah. to New York City. Mm -hmm. In New York City, you have 10, 10 people, 11 Welcome opinions. to life. <laughs> yeah. So, but it also applies to renters. Yes. Okay. yes. In a non-condo conversion. Right. Yes. Yes. Well, in this market, everybody wants everybody out that's not paying market rent. That's and they're the paying problem. incredible amount of monies for it. And you think about if you think about New York City, if that reality were to come true, what kind of city would we be living in? You know that that again. Boring. The beauty of this city is the diversity, economic, you know, demographically, you know, racially, and uh, and so that's a that's a real concern. And I'm seeing it very aggressively, particularly in my part of the district, mm -hmm. where gentrification is happening very very quickly, particularly in East Harlem. And so you're having a lot of people where are finding themselves in these situations where they're feeling that pressure and the landlord's breathing down their neck and trying to do whatever they can to force them out. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's an unfortunate. That's correct. Reality. It's unfortunate, but many times many of these people are given enough money to go buy a house. And owning equity in a home is so much more important than renting because then you have something that you're going to have um, you're going to have money where if you ever want to sell, you have a lot of money, or you may pass it on to your heirs or your kids or your grandparents. But that's not so happening in every situation. Home, not, when you have a buyout of a rent regulated apartment, you're talking about maybe $10,000, $15,000, and if you want to stay in New York City, that is not going to get you very far. All right, but if you go on my website, you'll see one for 1 $1.2 <laughs> million, 500000 300000 250 400 But that was a condo conversion situation, correct? That one of them. Many of them weren't. But yeah, in the recent years, um, most of these, a lot of these buildings are condo conversions. Right. But in general, if you're, someone's paying $400 a month and you can rent it for $6,000, $5,000, $4,000, $3,000, do the math, it's worth giving $100,000, $500,000 to the tenant to vacate mm -hmm. and then God bless them when they buy their home. And then what right do they have if they want to stay where they're at? Right. And they, they, they get to stay. <laughs> if they're living there full time, they get to stay. And that's the law in New York. You know, I can see both sides. There's a bigger issue that we haven't mentioned. New York City is limited in what they can do with rent regulation. <clears throat> okay, there, there's a statute. Which, which um, called the Earlstadt statute, which doesn't we, doesn't allow the city to make a law that overturns something that the state legislature made. So that limits the city council and all the good they want to do because the state won't allow it. So it's always that draw that back. So that there's an there's demolition. going to limit them in this. It limits it, it won't limit them in this this one because right. these are city laws. But it does hurt them. Like this, we're doing demolitions. Our firm we're demolishing buildings. Um, and if we demolish a building, everybody has to leave, and we have to pay people to leave, but they have to leave. So the state, it's a state law, and therefore the city can't take away the rights of the state. Of the state. Right. And that's the Earlstat okay. law. Mm -hmm. Thanks, guys. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for having us.